Okay, so, um, <laughs> so uh, this week's guest is, um, is a friend of mine, uh, and um, his name is Robert Fagan. Please welcome him. Hi. I'll tell you more. It's a nice round of applause just for you being a it friend really, of mine. It really was, but, yes. Um, he's, he's also uh, one of the smartest people I've ever met. Uh, and he does some of the coolest stuff I've ever, met, I've ever seen. Um, I met Robert back in 2006. Uh, he grew up with um, the members of the band Throwing Muses that I manage in Newport, Rhode Island. And by chance, um, we were playing in town on a day when, in Los Angeles, we were playing in town on a day that uh, he just happened to look up what's going on with the band. And so uh, he was living in LA, came over to the gig. We met up, we started talking, and we, um, I don't know, we, we always, we, we hit it off. We always kind of see, uh, seemed to uh, find lots of things to talk about. But um, Robert is, um, is um, maybe one of the most creative people I've ever worked with. Um, he is absolutely one of the most brilliant people I've ever worked with. He's the, one of the founders of a company called 42 Entertainment, which he'll talk about. And essentially, he's lived his life um, at the intersection of, 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 um, of management, marketing, and transmedia. Would that hey, be accurate? That's where this is. Oh, oh my slide is. Oh, nice. That's what my slide says. Well, I don't mean to steal his thunder, that's but <laughs> Robert's going to talk to you about some stuff, and then um, he's going to he's going to talk to you, show you some stuff. He's going to talk about what he does and, and, and what he's done and what he does now. He is um, one of the founders of a company called Blue Hats Entertainment, which uh, Blue Hats Creative, which you'll um, which which he'll tell you about, and then uh, he and I will will converse a little bit after after he shows you some of this stuff. And then um, I would love it if you guys would rise to the occasion and come up with um, a few really smart questions for, um, for one really smart guy. So um, uh, I'll, I'll let Robert take it from here. Robert, hey, please. Hey, Billy, thanks a lot. Um, thanks for being back here. I guess I was here a few years ago. Um, it's gotten bigger. Too many years for them. You, you were here in 2009. OK. So none of them were even All right, so alive. I won't then. be boring anyone. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly right. Uh, so um, thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, and um, I, I, uh, I guess I'm starting here at the present rather than uh, we're going to go back and talk a little bit about my past. But you know what to start at, at the present, which is uh, which is Blue Hats and Billy and I working together now on a project, which we'll uh, we'll, we'll get deeper into. Um, but um, I just wanted to start sort of start because in reflecting on on uh, this um, this talk today, you know, I find it. I found that you know this is sort of where my life has taken me, right? I mean, I have been a, a, a film producer, uh, you know, commercial producer. I've done six indie features. Um, was was in the advertising side uh, for for many years. Um, got into uh, Forty Two Entertainment, where sort of marketing and uh, and entertainment uh, blurred. Uh, I, I always with, say they're like the CIA of marketing with gaming. <laughs> like they, they're just this nameless, faceless kind of invisible entity that does crazy things that happen in the world. You know, it was a lot of fun uh, for the 10 years that I was involved with 42 and, you know, learned a lot about, um, you know, creating uh, groups and communities and, and, and what it means to, you know, marketing and, and entertainment. So we'll get, we'll get deeper into that too. But it is sort of the case that my life has sort of found, you know, I find myself here right now, which is, you know, at the intersection of music management and marketing. Um, so um, that will be a recurring theme uh, through the talk here. Um, and um, it, it's a fact it already is. It, in fact, a it recurring theme. Is. Yeah, um, right. So, um, you know, but my background does come from the uh, the, the understanding, right, that, you know, in 2001, um, one of the very first projects um, that I had the opportunity to work on with uh, with 42 Entertainment was uh, it was called The Beast. It was the first alternate, for lack of a better term, the first alternate reality game. Um, that um, you know was was born uh, of an idea from a guy named Jordan Weissman, who was a game designer in the 90s that I that I met. Uh, and he was a client of mine uh, in Chicago. He created Mech Warrior, a lot of uh, popular PC games. His company was eventually bought by Microsoft, and he was uh, moved over to uh, the entertainment division, where he founded the. Uh, he was the creative director of the Xbox division, and his sort of job was to move you know the gaming um, side of Microsoft into Hollywood. Uh, and at that point, he met Spielberg, and Spielberg said, "Hey, it's great. I want to do a, uh, I want to do a, a, an Xbox game for artificial intelligence." And Jordan said, "That's cool, but I've got another idea." And you know, it was, the, it was based really pretty much like you know, you remember Paul is dead, 
with the Beatles yeah, mythology. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. if you played the song backwards, there'd be, uh, you know, there's this talking from the Beatles that Paul was dead. It was a whole mythology that kind of spread around the world, um, <clears throat> you know, through tabloids, you know, but it was all pre-internet. So it was like, well, what if, you know, we did something like that now, you know, that the internet is here, but we didn't tell anybody And it was a total it. gamble that... Yeah, totally. ...that people would, would rise to the bait, right? I mean, you didn't know. No, we weren't really even, even aware if people would find it, you know? Right. I mean, so what we did was we put a, uh, a woman's um, name in the credits of the trailer of the film. We listed her as a sentient machine therapist. Yeah, so you guys therapist. remember the movie AI? Yeah? So, so in the trailer... There were credits given, and one of the credits was sentient machine, machine therapist. therapist. Right, that's right. A robot therapist, uh, and uh, you know, and then we thought, well, that may be enough to, uh, you know, just sort of see, say if people will Google it. Google was around yeah. in uh, 2001, I think. Yeah, I think it was Google or something like Google. <laughs> exactly. Um, but uh, that wasn't enough. Um, <laughs> so I think like we had to uh, we had to prompt Haley Jo Osmond and Jude Law to go on to to Letterman, and uh, and they they then you know stirred the pot a little by saying that the, this incredible therapist, therapist uh, Janine Sala, you know, yada yada. So that actually did drive people to the website where um, we so, had... So let me just break yeah. it down for them because, because sure. I, I think probably, you know, their heads are spinning a little bit just by, <laughs> from, from that little bit. Yeah. Right? So, so uh, what's his name? Haley Joe Osmond, right? Yeah. So he goes on Letterman and, and says a few things, a few cryptic yeah. things... Yeah, just drops ...about it this woman. ...conversation, that's right. ...about this woman and gives her name. That's right. And so people start doing internet searches on this person's name and what do they find then? They find a web page which looks pretty robust and pretty real. It, it, it turns out that she's a professor, ostensibly, right, a professor at Bangalore University. Um, and there are course selections that you can take. And you know, it was all written in HTML. There are hundreds of pages. Uh, at the end of the, at the, by the end of the project, we had created hundreds of web pages that people peruse through. But it started with Janine Sala and her homepage. And you know, everything looked kind of normal, but um, you know, it was just all of a sudden, if you kind of poked around a little, you know, longer, you could like, oh, you're in her email box, you're in her e inbox. And, and if you got into her inbox, you know, there was a phone number. If you called the phone number, there was actually a message from a man named Evan Chan. It turned out that uh, Evan Chan has just been murdered and he was uh, thrown off of his boat. Um, and, uh, and, and so... You get began, all this? So <laughs> like, it's crazy, but people are finding this stuff out. And, yeah. and, and people are not only finding this stuff out, I mean, talk about a gamble. Like, this is like, yeah. you, you know. But people start finding this stuff out, and then they start finding each other. Yeah, so that they can right. piece it together. Right? Well, so, you know, the name of the boat that Evan was thrown from was, uh, it was called the Cloudmaker. And, um, and, and a group of hardcore um, academics, essentially gamers, um, you know, said, um, you know, uh, they, they started a wiki, pre-wiki, called uh, thecloudmaker.org, which is still up, and you can play really virtually 85% of the game still. They, they archived everything and started sharing information. And that was the real key, you know, to, um, to the success of the game, was that, uh, you know, th that Jordan had the foresight to, you know, to say, if we make this so difficult that not one person could solve it, uh, you know, will people come together to share information and to move the story forward? And so that was... Creating, we're creating what he termed the hive mind, right? Was that his? Was that, was, his term? that was actually the press that that created that. Ah, um, but um, but uh, but but nonetheless, it was born, if you will. Uh, the hive mind was real. People did come together, share information, move the story forward. You know, for for uh, you know recognition within the community. You know, we had linguists and you know and PhDs and physics and you know I mean all kinds of you know uh, people that would contribute to. Oh, that that's obvious. I know the answer to that. You know, and then they would you know type their answer in, and people. Oh, that. that leads to this other page and right. you know and so people had to begin to uh we we call it a deconstructed narrative uh, and they, they piece the story back together yeah, that's a key term actually yeah. a deconstructed narrative because yeah. we use that all the time still right we use that that term yeah. yeah which is basically you know you have a story that you know goes from point a to point z and you just shatter it into a million pieces and leave leave them leave that's them right. scattered around and then you kind of create little breadcrumb trails to those pieces. Yeah, that's right. And you hope that lots of people get together in lots of ways to solve 
the puzzle, basically, and put yeah, the story and, back together. I mean, it was great that we had, you know, the base of fans that we began with a Steven Spielberg project because, you yeah. know, people were very already motivated, you know, all things Spielberg. Um, had we started with a property that wasn't, you know, um, as popular, right. um, you know, it could have been a whole different, uh, a, d a different scenario. And we'll get, you know, deeper and later on to, you know, the problems of ARGs, um, you know, that aren't, uh, you know, well-known properties. Um, but, um, but nonetheless, uh, you know, that happened. I, I should say, just as a, a footnote, it was funny that uh, Jordan said to, uh, to Spielberg, he said, um, y y there's just one important thing, you don't tell anybody. Uh, about this, uh, that, that we're doing this. Um, and so Spielberg went back to Warner Brothers and he said, uh, you're going to write a million dollar check and, uh, and I'm not telling you what it's for. <laughs> and, uh, and they wrote the check. Well, you, he's, he was the Spielberg. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, he was. <laughs> you can get that. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know, that's all to say that, um, you know, um, that I know a little bit about, uh, you know, building communities, you know, in a non-traditional sense, you know, creating content that engages people, uh, you know, in an indigenous way that's, you know, that is, um, you know, um, it's indigenous to the web, right? You know, um, it's not repurposed content. You know, it's made for, about, and by, you know, um, you know. There, yes, there. You know, there are what we we term the puppet masters, but really, you know, the community and you know uh, are, are also content creators. You know, and will shape you know the story um, as it goes. And and so you know, I think that, that that's the real takeaway is is that you know, uh, I mean, obviously we we know the world that we're living in now, but it, it's worth just sort of like going over you know um, today's wired audience. Yeah. Um, they are primed to ignore or edit traditional advertising. Um, attracted to alternative engagement. Uh, there's, uh, there's a willingness to be empowered to create content and interact together in collaborative groups. Um, is that up there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, uh, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I can't see what you're, what you're talking about until I, unless I turn. So um, I turn. We, we now are, uh, we've erased boundaries through glo global communities and social networks. I mean, obviously we all know, know this and, you know, the Arab Spring and all of this stuff, you know, and well, North Korea is next to uh, we'll break through that. But, um, you know, that we can solve anything, be anywhere, and engage anyone instantly. So, you know, this is an incredibly powerful, um, you know, spot to be in. Um, you know, which, which goes back to, uh, to, to my sort of core, uh, you know, I, I started out in marketing uh, and content, um, you know, creation as a producer. My wife, uh, I, I, I'm originally from Newport, as Billy said, Newport, Rhode Island, um, and you know, I, I, I sort of did everything that I could to not move to Los Angeles. Um, I, I went to school in Wisconsin, I lived in Chicago, then I moved back to uh, uh, Manhattan, and I, and I lived there, and I spent 18 years not moving to LA, you know, because I would never find my wife in Los Angeles. And, Within the first month of um, actually moving there, I did meet my wife, and um, so that, that's how that goes. You know, I said so, he was the smartest guy. I'd yeah, ever had, but I didn't say in every way. Well, it's lu it's luck, you know, too. So you know, I did that. That is a sort of point that I want to bring up. You know, it, there does seem to be a certain amount of luck that takes, um, you know. Um, that takes place in, in the success of all of these things, yeah. right? You know, yeah. like, you know, just happening to, you know, be at a certain Yeah, level. but keep in mind that it's not luck that happens while you're sitting in a chair. It's luck that happens while you're out agitating and doing and changing and, and banging into other yes. things. That's, yes. that's the kind of luck we mean. We don't mean yeah. passive luck. We mean active luck. No, and, and, and to different. that point, it really leads into the story a little bit deeper of how I met Billy. I was, um, I was in the offices of 42 Entertainment and our chief creative officer, Alex Lewis, was uh, mentioning um, he's all black, you know, goth kind of, uh, you know, a uh, cat that, uh, you know, but he was uh, mentioning uh, throwing mooses one day. And I said, oh my God, I said, I, you know, I know David, I've known David and Kristen since I was 10 years old. And uh, I said, you know, I got to really look and see what they're up to. And I Googled uh, throwing mooses and it said uh, we, they're playing uh, Saturday night. It was Thursday night. Yeah. They're playing Saturday night in Los Angeles. This is completely random. Yeah. And I uh, had not seen them or talked to David in 10 years, and um, there they were playing. Um, so I went down to the show and met, met, uh, met, met with Billy, and uh, we really you know, found that we really had similar circumstances going on, with, both with his wife, Kristen, uh, in terms of putting out uh, music in, in, the, in this day and age without a record label as an independent solo artist, and my wife, who, was wanted, to, uh, who wanted to do the same after having been in a popular, uh, you know, 90s all-female band called L7, she wanted to put out a, um, 
a solo record. Uh, but you know, without without any support of the band or anything, I mean, of the of the labels, you know, um, I thought, well, this is going to be a challenge to uh, to do. And I kept hearing from her, you know, about like you know how the roadies get this and and uh, and the stage gets this and the, and the club gets this and I was like you know well, when do you, when do you guys get paid yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was just like there's got to be something you know yeah. we got to flip the script here uh, and then Billy and I started really talking about what we could do to um, you know in a real way affect change in the distribution of music and um, and out of those talks uh, we developed um, an idea that uh, has since gone on to you know to um, Transform itself in in, uh, in ways that I'm not involved with anymore. But um, that was the beginnings of uh, Cash Music. Um, do you want to say just a little bit about Cash? Well, uh, you, m most of you know about Cash Music, but Cash Music is as, uh, was started as a way of empowering artists to take control over their own means, not only of production but of marketing and distribution as well, and promotion. Um, and it has evolved into a platform uh, of, uh, that creates tools for artists to, to, to do all of those things on the internet with complete ownership of their own platform. So the, um, you know, what WordPress did for bloggers and what Firefox is to browsers, uh, you know, uh, cash music is to music. Um, and so mu music creators get to control and own all of their own stuff. You know, you don't own your Facebook page, but you do own your cash music tools. Um, and, um, but Robert and I founded it as a, as a, as a means of, of managing artist projects. And, um, and, and we created a management dashboard, and, and, um, yeah. and it was our vision you know, at the time. That I think, we were, we, I think we, were, we were before our time. You um, know, and, and that is just as bad as being late, I think. You yeah. know? Um, but Sometimes you know, it's you, worse than being late. Because, because when you're late, you can, you can follow the, 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 the first movers. You know, the, I think there's not that much to first mover advantage in real life right. because you watch a first mover and you go, oh, okay, that was a cool way to do it, but I, I would do it this way. And you can still do it and bring your own offering. That's right. But, but being early is brutal. I don't yeah. think you can be early. So, you know, but nonetheless, I mean, a lot of good things did come out of it. And, you know, we did learn that there was, uh, you know, um, you know, look, I mean, <clears throat> Billy started his side, which was, you know, the subscription-based model to, you know, engage people with, uh, you know, funding uh, for the recordings of Kristen. And my wife at the time was needing to do a tour. So, you know, I thought, well, that's cool. What can I do on the tour side that's sort of like that to get people engaged? And we had just recently been married, I remember, and I, we, I came across a, a wedding registry um, that, uh, that we ended up going with. And it was, you know, it said, uh, do you want to uh, pay for Robert and Danita's massage in Hawaii? 50 bucks. <laughs> You know, and I was like, this is just great because it's like this top interface, but the money just goes into Kina's cash, you know, <laughs> and I thought, you know, this is, this is pretty amazing, you know, so we kind of flipped that a little bit yep. and then said, you know, buy Danita a pair of strings, you know, um, for 10 bucks or, you know, um, meet, her, meet her at or... that. Yeah, exactly. And basically use that model. And, you know, we had just tr tremendous engagement and, um, you know, and, and so that was really uh, an, an interesting. Um, yeah, it was really it was really successful and, and fun, and we got a lot of press for that and a lot of attention, and a lot of that sort of went on to seed some of the enthusiasm behind what cash music is today. And what and what also what we're what we're doing now. So um, you know, which we'll get to. So you know, yeah, I think that these three intersections here again, um, you know, which is music management and uh, and marketing is sort of like. Again, this is very true of me. It's, it's sort of a, I love music. It's what I like to do, right? I'm good at you know management, and you know I get paid to do marketing, you know. But but it's the it's the intersection of all three that you know makes one a happy person, right? I think you know I, like I don't know that it is pro probably the case that you know people just do one thing anymore, right? And that's, no, right, right. you know I mean it well, is, it looks a little know, like a hedgehog gotta... concept, doesn't it? Anybody who's had my management class, <laughs> it does. <laughs> Sorry, but that's it. <laughs> uh, I don't Sorry. know what that is. Sorry, but, I didn't yeah, mean yeah, to go yeah. commercial on it. But, um, <laughs> yeah. but yeah, it's, it's a concept from Jim Collins' book, Good to Great, oh, which, good, is, good, which good, is, you good. know, there's three circles, and where they overlap is where you go. Oh, there so you go. Those three Great. circles are your yeah. passion, where the money is, what you, know, what you do best. Well, I found this this morning, but... Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's exactly right. I mean, you're proving my point. Thank you, Billy. Awesome. Thank you. Thank yes. you, Robert. Um, we just love each so other. <laughs> we are so into each other. <laughs> <laughs> How sweet it is. 
Um, so our content is defined by three. So, um, so I'm sort of saying, when I say our content, I mean Blue Hats Creative, which is me uh, and my partner, Maria Achaves, and, uh, and, you know, and, and now Billy um, you know, on the management side. You know? And the reason that I wanted to kind of bring it up is to say that, yes, I've, I've, you know, we've talked a little bit about where I've come from, a little bit about where I am. And now, you know, it's putting in the secret sauce uh, to, you know, to, to what I'm, you know, want to do next, you know, which is to say that, you know, I want to create original content. And it's sort of a pitch in a way for Blue Hats because, you know, because I can, I guess, right? Yeah. And why not? I'm here. So, I mean, it, <laughs> people will go on YouTube and look up Blue Hats. So. Yeah. Um, like us on Facebook. Uh, <laughs> um, so, our content is defined by original. It incorporates casual gaming and mechanisms that are fun to do and feel integral to the program. So, you know, one of the things that we learned about alternate reality games was, you know, as I was saying, it's, um, <clears throat> it's great when uh, you have a property that, uh, you know, like the Nine Inch Nails campaign or, you know, like the Halo campaign, where, you know, had a rabid fan base of people that were really willing to, you know, um, cross over and, and get into this alternate reality game and, and, you know, and sort of move the story forward. But, um, but when you don't have an intellectual property um, that is, uh, you know, already has that, uh, you know, story behind it, it's very, very tough to get people to engage, you know, in, in a story. So, you know, that goes back to a lot about, you know, um, the, the, the need to tell a story in a concise way, you know, yeah. to have a beginning, a middle, and an end, um, you know, to what you're doing, to think about that, uh, uh, you know, and we're going to get deep into that. And that has everything to do with what, what is, what, you know, what, what is marketing? Yes. You know, marketing is, is you telling your story and you finding the opportunity to tell your story or creating the opportunity to tell your story. Um, so, you know, you, you, you know the, the, the three steps of marketing are creating awareness, building connection and monetizing that connection. And you create awareness, you interrupt somebody, you get a chance to interrupt somebody once, you, you, you create awareness. But then once you've interrupted them once, that you, you need to build connection. And That's right. you do that through storytelling. That's right. Otherwise, people can't relate. They don't understand why they should care, what's in it for them, what's, what's special. And, and, and when you build that connection, and that's the most vital part of that three-step process, when you build connection, um, adequately to, to you know uh, appropriately or, or or successfully let's say um you're then at the same time you're communicating value so you're convincing people of the value in what you're doing by the by, by virtue of your storytelling by by virtue of, of of the story you tell and the story that they that they now have simulated for themselves in their own minds with their own neuronal connections and then once you've done that you've adequately um sufficiently uh, communicated value, you can then ask them to buy something. Mm -hmm. And at that point, right. they will part with their money willingly, happily, because, because hopefully the price that you've set for the thing that you're offering um, is to them a bargain, right? It's, the $10 bill in their pocket, I use this example all the time, the $10 bill in their pocket is not worth, a, 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 is not worth anywhere near what the thing you have for them is. And, and they don't want that $10 bill anymore. They want you to have it so that they can get the thing they want, right? That, that exchange, that value exchange is so favorable to them by virtue only of your storytelling. And that's why, that's why I so admire what Robert does because he, he's so, he, he's so um, um, skilled at getting people not only to listen to the story but to want to listen to the story. And then, to, and then to extract value from the story. Well, I think, I mean, I think that there's a truth here in that, you know, Billy and I did not have an opportunity to talk about any of this stuff, or I didn't even show you the slides even no, beforehand. That's I'm and yet, um, you know, and yet, you know, it's as if we wrote it together. So, I oh. mean, you know, this next point is being social media integration maximizes impact to target demographic through systems designed to build conversion in community groups. So it's exactly what you're saying. I mean, you know, which is like, you know, it's the social media outreach through story. Uh, and our motto at Blue Hats is create create, engage, reward, right? So taking simple game mechanics, you know, that we all know are proven and true, you know, it's like, you know, you create content that is participatory, you know, indigenous to, you know, uh, interaction, uh, and then you reward them for engaging in it. And that, that cycle just repeats itself. It's so funny because uh, it's, to, it's to success. It's a know? little tweak on the create awareness, build connection, monetize the connection, right? So in that case, we're talking about, you know, you're talking about create, engage, reward. So the, it, what's funny is the middle step is the same. Yes. Right? Yeah. But from the, from the content creator's side, it's like, well, I'm going to create something. Right. From the marketer's side, at that moment, it's create awareness of that. 
creation. That's right. Right. Then there's engagement no matter what. So there's this sort of confluence right there, right? Immediately where the X, where the cross and the X is, it's That's that right. engagement. It's that, that ability to build connection. And then you're talking about rewarding people at the moment that we're asking for the money. Right. Right? Which is an amazing, it, it, it really is like a funhouse mirror version of the same, <laughs> yeah, that same exactly. marketing thing. That's right. And, you know, and it also you know, makes it authentic, right, in a, in a way. I mean, what you do as marketers and as content creators, you know, then becomes, you know, there really does a, a line blurs, at least for me, in, you know, in being able to sort of sleep at night that, you know, the content I'm creating is sort of cool. Do you know what I mean? It's like there's an authenticity to it that I enjoy doing. Uh, yeah, know? and there's also another aspect of this that I like so much, which is uh, it's, it's, it, it has inherent in it is, is a sense of generosity. Mm-hmm. You're, you're creating and you're engaging, so you're making, you're making yourself available and vulnerable, but you're also then rewarding. So you're, you're, you're basically paying people back for their attention, right? Absolutely. And that is a generous act. And, and through real generosity and, th and real authenticity, we make the magic happen. That's where the relationship gets really rich and, 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 and there's money thrown off by, by us doing the right thing and getting to the right place. We, can, we, we, create, we create wealth from that imagination. And that's, and that's thank you very much. We'll see you next. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're going to the second okay. half of this seminar. Uh, rather than producing traditional ads, we focus on creating positive entertainment experiences. These experiences have the power to shift brand perception significantly, right? So, you know, it's going back to what I was saying, which is like, you know, it, it is possible these days to actually, like, you know, really blend, you know, um, both together, you know, yeah. create the story for the marketing, which creates the content, which, you know, informs the distribution you know it's the it's the nine inch nails you know in a lot of ways well I, and we'll talk more about the nine inch yeah. nails thing right yeah. the year zero thing. yeah but but um but i, I did want to say that 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 um I, I don't know if if this is in there or not but 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 a big part of this is also that that your your storytelling begins not when the product is finished but when you begin to create the product right so the the the, the act the act of of creation is part of your story, and when you begin to, when you when you communicate that story, and you start to, you you start to 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 let people um, in on your process and um, in on the decision making uh, along the way, and and all your aesthetic, the the aesthetic sense of what you do, and you bring them in, and you truly make yourself, you lay yourself bare, and you make yourself vulnerable, right? Then you know you you you've begun the marketing process because you begin the storytelling. And, right. and you've really begun to engage, and, and at that point, y you got them, right? That's at right. that point, and I don't mean that in a manipulative way, I just mean like at that point, you're in it together. And that's what's so great about Kickstarter, for instance. You that's know, right. You know, we, we're, we're actively involved in a, in, a, in, a fairly, in a fairly significant Kickstarter campaign right now, and we just finished our first week. Tomorrow's, tomorrow it'll be a week. And, um, um, and, and, and the... The, the, the we're doing this together aspect of it is really the only thing that matters. Certainly it's the only thing that matters to Kickstarter. Um, when, when we talk about that aspect of our messaging, like when we talk to Kickstarter people about the fact that really what we're trying to communicate is that we're doing this together. You're helping us make something. We're making it together. They're like, oh, you're singing our song. This is the best thing. We, you know, this, is what, this, is, this is what we do. That's right. Um, and, and, so, and so that's where I think this, this, this aspect of, of storytelling, where it, it has to begin when the product is, is begun, and, and it doesn't end. It kind of never ends. Well, and you know, Not like to make you tired, but. like uh, the old Lessig um, video that talked about uh, the record industry being a one-way street, you know, for so long. Oh yeah. Um, and now it's two-way, you know, it's a two-way culture. Like like all old, you know, folk songs that were yep. oral, you know, based and not, you know, um, the record company pushing it out one way, one way. This is what you're going read to only. see here. Read here. only, right? Exactly. Was, read it, only. You know. So it's a, you know, Robert's referring to a talk given by Lawrence Lessig. Um, uh, the eminent professor of I recommend seeing it if you haven't yeah of the law you can it's a TED talk yeah I think so yeah. you can search L Lawrence Lessig TED talk but Larry Lessig is also one of the creators of um, Creative Commons which um, some of you use some of you don't use but but um, it's an, it's important it's a it's a, it's an important way of um, of of altering uh, the 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 automatic rules of copyright which um, which allow you to share music without without 
um, bypassing your legal your legal rights. Um, so in, in other words, it's like it's saying you know the, you know it's not right to sue twelve year old kids and it's not right to steal music, but maybe there's something in between. You know that we can work out. You know, right? And like and, you know, you can share your music and you know use it non-commercially, and there are other ways to. And so Lessig's you know, go about that answer. So Lessig's know? talk was all about the fact that yeah, for years and years there was broadcast only, push out That's only. Right. You know, the the record company model was read only. You can only read this, right? Um, it was like uh, you know, I, you guys are I don't know CD-ROMs, right? Were you little when CD-ROMs were around? You, were you a little kid? You had like like jump. Jumpstart Spanish CD-ROMs or something. They were read-only, right? You couldn't change them. You couldn't do anything but watch them, right? And that's, that's what the record companies yeah. were. They were read-only. But then when the internet happened and you begin to like take something and do a cover of your favorite song or remix something or, and post it up or make a little movie with it, it's read-write. At that point, you take the read-only thing and you that's write right. something and you push it back out. Now it's a two-way street, right? You get that? <laughs> Just say yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So, um, so you know that 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 really got me kind of interested in you know creating programming that was specifically you know like participatory, right, on a, on a larger scale, right, than say just you know alternate reality gaming. You know, how can we branch out you know into the culture at large and create programming, you know, social programming. Uh, <clears throat> You know, interactive programming that you know is engaging on that level, um, and um, and and out of that came um, a project called the Top Floor, which um, I, I want to show you. Um, it is um, it is dated, um, uh, but I want to talk about the failure of it as much as I do um, the idea. Um, so this is a uh, this is a, we've we've done about a hundred shows uh, online of uh, this this the. Uh, Floor, the sh uh, television, basically it was a television show for the internet um, called The Top Floor. And it was, you know, it was a, a hosted VJ with a, uh, with, a, you know, with a DJ. And, you know, and, and back in the days when, uh, you, before Ustream, there was a, there was a platform called uh, Stickam. It was like Ustream that allows you to chat. And uh, we just we just jerry rigged this platform and we used it to create this show um, where we had you know people interact from all um, over the world. So they would have fifty or sixty thousand kids from all over the world listening to this DJ spin and like dancing in their bedrooms in front of their webcams. Yeah. And and the and the video jock could switch switch between views so that everyone watching this event could see different kids in different places, you know, in China and, 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 yeah. and, and, and the Czech Republic. And I mean, they're just like, it, it was insane. And like 50 or 60,000 kids all hooked up to their webcams and headphones, right? Yeah. And they're It was dancing. amazing. And you know, they'd be like, they'd, they'd shout out where they were from and just the, the, the amount of engagement was just so, I mean, you know, we will do the show and I'll tell you afterwards sort of where we're at with this. But, you know, basically, you know, it took three years to get in the door at yeah, MPB so and then, you know. Downtown LA, from your bedroom, your parents' kitchen, from your cell phone, we want to stream you dancing now on live TV. So flip on that webcam and show us how you get down. Tonight, we're dropping a brand new video remix from Lady Gaga, a special performance from the Jabberwocky crew, and LMFAO is live on their webcam. You've just arrived at Top Floor. White boy wasted, toasted, pasted, stupid, tasted. You just happened upon Top Floor, and right now, people worldwide are joining in in our digital revolution. What are you waiting for? Let's get this party going. Come on. Freestyle. Can't sing good. It don't matter. Take a look at our first webcam. Her name is... So, um... So you get the idea. You know, this was the MTV. So we did... You know, this was... When we did this, it was independent, much more punk rock, like EDM, like, you know, house and stuff. Um... And then MTV got a hold of it, and they were like, you know, let's make a pilot and cheese it up, and you know, and, and do all this stuff, you know, that that they do, and put it in a dome, and all this crap. But uh, you know, um, put it in a dome. That's yeah. what they always say. <laughs> yeah. But the uh, but the core idea was really, you know, was a good one. You know, we knew that it really worked because we proved the concept because we did a fucking hundred shows. You know what I mean? And so. You know, so MTV then finally, you know, pays the money and they and they do the the, the, the pilot and um, 
you know, and then they, they bring it to the broadcasters for their annual meeting or whatever, and the broadcasters are like, well, you know, this is great, but, you know, like, we don't know what to do with it. They're like, well, why not? It's like, well, it's not the Jersey Shore. It's like, no, it's a dance show. It's like, oh, but we want the Jersey Shore. It's like, yeah, but it's a dance show. It's, like, it's just like back and forth. It's yeah. just like nuts. Um, so, um, you know, so, it, which is to say that, you know, it took many years later now that I'm involved with electric, um, you know. Um, so this, uh, th what year was this? This was like 2007? Eight? Seven, seven uh, or eight? What year was yeah. that? Lady it was two thousand eight. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so it, now it goes to are, show you, you know, uh, Daryl Zanuck has a quote. You know, famous producer in in, in uh, you know twentieth century, start founded twentieth century Fark, but you know, he said the only two people that make it in Hollywood are those that, <clears throat> you know, um, those that have talent and those that have perseverance. Um, so you know, we've sort of come full circle with, with the show because now we, we just found an investor we're going to go back online with this. But we went to, we went to Pasquale who's the owner of uh, uh, Insomniac Events. I do the filming for these uh, electric daisy carnivals. And um, we said, you know, um, we said, hey, do you, you, know, you want to do a show like this? It could be cool to do at EDC Vegas, you know, and if you partner up with MTV. He said, absolutely not. You know, I don't want to partner with MTV. And we said, uh, and he said, well, why not? He said, none of my audience watch TV. Yeah, right. I don't need MTV. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, you yeah. know, there's no, like, real reason. So now we are full circle doing the show. What we should have done to begin with, never brought it to broadcast, never done the deal with MTV, right. to now do it ourselves the way we want and back yeah. here again. So, you know, it just, it just was an example of saying, you know, perseverance is something. You know, if you have absolutely. and you believe in a project, you know, just keep going. I mean, maybe this should be our next Kickstarter. Yeah, yeah. Passion and tenacity <laughs> is everything. Yeah. So. Um, <clears throat> okay. So then there's this. Yeah. This is this is interesting. So you guys, so, how many of you are familiar with the Nine Inch Nails campaign for Year Zero? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So some of you are. Good. <clears throat> so um, you know, so this came about. Trent was um, on tour with his band. And I uh, was a fan of, uh, of a game that we had just, uh, we had just released called uh, I Love Bees, which was for the launch of Halo uh, 2. And, uh, you know, it involved a, uh, an audio drama. It was a, a four-hour radio drama that we uh, created from the Halo universe following six characters, sort of like shortcuts. Uh, but <clears throat> the, uh, the audio was all broken up into 60-second sound bites and disseminated uh, across payphones all across the country. And so um, uh, the, the players, would, got that? players would have to find these GPS coordinates and they would go out to these payphones and the payphones would ring and then the, it would get archived down to the web and people pieced it all back together. And Trent was on his bus at the time, newly sober, and, you know, he was a big gamer and he played this game. And so he called up and head, said, right? yeah, yeah. So he, he called up and said that he wanted to, uh, to collaborate yeah. on, you know, basically his version of the wall, if you will. Uh, you know, it's a sort of dystopian future. It takes place like 15 years you know from now but it was a concept album really at the end of the day and you know and it was interesting just in the way that you know he created story and you know alternative ways to distribute the album you know yeah. um, and, and, so. and and tell them how you seeded this campaign uh, well it's in here I think oh, it, okay. it's in here we can chat right, that good. if something oh and missing. I think we need to lower the volume on. if the physical medium of the album is obsolete what then is a concept album in this digital age not simply a loose association of thematic elements and handsome liner notes, Year Zero is an idea made form through a multitude of medias. In 2007, an unsettling and fractured snapshot of a dystopian future began to seep into our own, manifesting as dozens of websites detailing the bleak existence of the denizens of Year Zero, a world and time ravaged by war and global warming, haunted by the myth of civil liberty and individual freedoms. An immersive and interactive experience, engaging players to build upon their involvement and create a community, starting with a t-shirt. The hidden message opened the door and participants flooded in, discovering and sharing the shattered glimpses of the future as they were found. So when at concerts in Lisbon, Barcelona, and Manchester, USB drives were discovered containing leaks of songs from the new album, the global community stepped forward to unearth URLs hidden in the files and decipher images and phone numbers encoded in static through spectrograph analysis. Upon release, the CD itself acted as a gateway, both for the casual participant citizen. By calling this number, you and your family are implicitly pleading guilty to the consumption of anti-American media. And the dedicated. Players began to step beyond information gathering 
and started to act, both in the real world and through the expression of original art. Some of the best pieces appeared in the Village Voice, LA Weekly, and other magazines and newspapers across the country. Finally, a select few were recruited to attend the first resistance meeting in LA. You allowed yourselves to be hustled onto a van. You let us take away any way of communicating with the outside world that you had. The players had engaged and interacted, and now, live year zero. So, um, so yeah, that was, yeah, th yeah there was a, there was a, um, one letter from, on a tour short, uh, one letter was skewed, like it would say Portugal, Lisbon, you yeah. know, uh, Madrid, and, uh, and, and one kid found that, you know, if he put them all together, it, it, uh, it spelled, I'm trying to believe, he Googled, I'm trying to believe dot com, and, um, that's where they went to the website, and, uh, crazy. it was sort of a very Norman Rockwell, uh, you know, American, you know, uh, you know, all is well in the world, but if you rolled over it, it was much more children of men, and, you know, uh, the government's, you know, poisoning, uh, people, and there's a whole story there that you could, uh, you could follow, right, um, right. but, um, and, and, and you leaked, uh, tracks by putting them on USB drives, that's and right, yeah, leaving them in urinals, yes, and, they were claimed. Yeah, which is yeah, that's always right. mind blowing to people. I had um, I had read a study around the time that uh, in uh, Union Square, NYU was doing a study, and they they threw out um, hundreds of USB drives, and they found that nine out of ten people would pick up a USB drive and virus or whatever, just like and stick it in, plug it know. in the machine. Yeah, yeah, crazy. I, I like how you called the, the the tracks leaked, and they were in urinals. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't help but notice. <laughs> um, yeah. So um, yeah. So um. So this is the kind of stuff he does. So he, uh, he drives me crazy. So. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, so then this is then, you know, so then I started, you know, thinking about like, you know, communities, as I say, I do, I do a lot of work for the uh, Live Nation and Insomniac and, um, and these electric daisy carnivals are, are really unique um, experiences. Um, and, you know, I'd never was. So you were asked to go down, you were, you were asked to like check it out, right? And, and you're, yeah. you show up and it's let it, like, you know, teenagers. Yeah. And you're like, ah. Eh. Yeah, yeah, but you know, I mean, I had dipped into EDM in the '90s. You know, went over to Rotterdam and you know went to some festivals in yeah. you know, uh, you know '96 or whatever. And you know, it was like Carl Cox. I mean, you know, it was just like, you know, yeah. you know, you know, have some fun and you know, say, hey, where are you going to meet? Let's meet in the heart of it. You know, yeah, that kind yeah. of thing. And you know, okay, you know, four hours later, yeah. you know, you meet every meet meet up with everybody. But um, the amazing thing was is that uh, you know, going to to uh, the EDC festival. Um, was that, uh, you know, there's such, such a community there, you know, uh, this guy that's built it, uh, the promoter, Pasquale, he, the first thing that I found was interesting was that, you know, he calls the, um, the headliners the people, right, mm -hmm. not the DJs, and, you know, and it's the, um, you know, in, in these festivals sell out, you know, six but, yeah, months. Yeah, talk about flipping it, right? Yeah. The, the headliner for him is the people, yeah. right? And, yeah. And they really are the point. Yeah, and they sell out six months in advance before any DJs are ever announced. Four hundred thousand tickets. Yeah. Four hundred bucks a piece. Yeah. Six months in advance. Yeah. So uh, you know uh, that's a big community. That's, and that's business. A, that's that's a you know that's a big experience. You know, and that, that that shows the the power of the experience and the brand to you know to to that people trust in right. You know. Well, and, they trust them because they buy those tickets before any any, any talent is announced. Correct. So, so, so I mean, then I thought, well, this is a great audience to tap into because, they're, you know, I mean, engaging st sort of 42-like stuff, you know, with a wired audience that's mobile, tech-savvy, young, you know, and, you know, and already community, you know, this yeah. is like, you know, this is a, this yeah. is a burgeoning, burgeoning. I, I do want to make, here. I do want to make one point, you know, one school point while I'm here. You know, when yeah. we talk about branding in this program, it, we don't mean 
anything yucky in, in that. You know, when, when we say branding, what we mean is trust. Brand equals trust. And so, you know, Pasquale built brand to the extent that the trust was so implicit that he'd sell out without announcing any, any artists, any, any, any DJs. Yeah, that's um, right. Which is, which is really, talk, I mean, talking about communicating value, I mean, we should all do such a good job. So, um, so, I, so I wrote and concepted the idea for this trailer for, for, uh, for New EDC New York um, last year with, you know, the, with a clue at the top. Um, you know, I don't know if you, if you, we'll see if you can see it, but I'll point it out later if not. But um, you know, basically it's a phone number and you, you, you go to the phone number and then you can win tickets right. and things like that. So it's taking the music video to you know, uh, you know, a new level. But, uh, and I won't play the whole thing. But, uh, You know, it's a lot of fun, and um, <laughs> to say the least. And and I, and, I, and I said, yeah, I can do this. You know, uh, you know, sure. You know, I, the you, guys DJs, shot, you guys shot that in a day. Is that what you said? Um, well, uh, we shot well. The, we shot the, uh, the 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 festival's two days. Yeah, uh, we yeah. shot the intro and the outro um, in a day, um, and that was actually L.A. Uh, 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 for New York. Um, Funny. I think it looked okay. Yeah. Um, Fooled me. <clears throat> okay, so. Um, I, I guess we're kind of running out of time here, so um, I do want to kind of wrap it up with um, you know the L7 thing, the what Kickstarter, we're doing now. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, sorry uh, that I droned on so long. Um, no, I don't, I don't know. It was, so uh, so cool. Billy and I. Uh, so do you want to you, you, you want to do like a little intro? Okay. So um, uh, so I was brought on in, in a management capacity in August. Uh, yeah. um, to to um, to be involved with L7. Um, there's there was going to be a reunion. Um, and um, but b before anything, there was a documentary film uh, that was that was being put together, and this documentary film uh, was basically a, a view of what it was to be uh, in the midst in, in the middle of the grunge movement in the '90s. Um, and uh, directed by uh, a film a filmmaker named Sarah Price, who did the Yes Men and um, American, uh, movie. American movie. Right, yeah. and. Um, and so it was, uh, we, you know, we decided that, that it was going to be vital that we do a crowdfunding campaign to put together, um, uh, to, I don't know, be, to begin to tell the story and to put together a product line, uh, something that would, that would attract people and, and reward them for bringing their support and, and, and to put together a narrative where we're building something together. So we created this Kickstarter campaign, but before that, we yeah. we did we engaged in an amazing amount of groundwork, yeah, kind of led by right. Danita, who is yeah, who we, is, um, we, we knew. I mean, based on basically everything that we've just talked about, we knew certain truths to be the case, right? right. How to build community, right? We we knew we know how to do this. We knew that we needed to do it for this page, right? So what did we do? We started, you know, nine months out. We had Danita, uh, you know, curate her these uh, these photographs, these archival photographs from. Um, you know, from uh, her, her 
collection of stills on the Facebook page. On which the was, Facebook page, at that page. time it was like sixty something thousand likes or no, something. Oh no, it was twenty. It was a year ago. It was just okay. cracked fifteen thousand. Okay, so, so the year, L seven year, Facebook page is fifteen thousand. Ninety thousand likes. Yeah. Right. So basically, by doing regular updates Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at twelve o'clock um, noon, curated to a degree, you know, by Danita, that you know was like, I think the the the, the secret sauce. Absolutely. To, was. You know, um, you know, because it was really she was really conscious about color and and you know what was black and white photo versus video uh, you know um, all members of the band single members like she really took a lot of thought into that and and she and, was and participating it, with yes. her followers and it and nice. and the response was just it just blew up like we get like 4,000 5,000 likes on any given post maybe 1,500 likes in an hour you know and we thought for some reason you know we thought like you know the pipeline is not closed on Facebook for us or like you yeah. know what is going on we yeah. really couldn't quite understand what the engagement was yeah but, it, um, those numbers were surprisingly great yeah but but I mean I, I as I've learned more about the algorithms there you know it, it does favor um, people who have liked posts so you know right. the more um, so by starting earlier on before they changed some of their uh, you know um, their rules um, we sort of slipped in under the radar there but through now, regular content updates and the yeah. only thing that we owned really was the Facebook that's a page correct which is which is not owning anything um, and, and, and that's when I came on board, and that's, right. and, and that's when I, um, I started putting together a plan with Robert where we could begin to own something. That's so right. So it was very important that we have a website. It was very important we have a, a mailing list. Well, we thought we had 70,000 emails because of all this L7 merch sold through the 90s. As it turns out, it was all sold through PayPal, and PayPal only keeps your crap for seven years. So um, we had no email addresses. So, no. we, so we, we were supposed to go live with a pledge campaign prior to Kickstarter. Right. Uh, when well, we learned that we had no mailing list. We had, you know, maybe 900 people or something and, like that. And so, uh, so job one became generating email, um, e yeah. email address uh, acquisition. So um, we ended up going, uh, putting a plan together where, where a lot of the stuff that Danita, who is the band leader, the chief singer-songwriter, um, and Robert's wife, um, putting together a plan where she's posting stuff on a regular basis, but then she started to put in posts where she was telling people, look, if you sign up for our mailing list, we'll give you some special stuff. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were rewarding people for, 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 for acting the way we wanted them to act. Um, and in a month, and then I would then I would boost those posts. I would start to really um, sort of look at the insights in the demographic here, knowing that it was a slightly skewed male, you know, uh, 35 to 44. I would start targeting that and boost, you know, not much. I mean, like you know, total I spent I think like. $250, yeah. like total. Yeah. Um, so that's not, you know, that's well worth it. Uh, you know, I think we're, we were spending like just like under eight cents in email, um, you know, which is, which is fantastic. And I, I just got to tell you, like this, for those of you who think like e email's dead or, you know, like you don't use it much, I get it totally. But like for us, we would have been murdered without this email list. I mean, we, yeah. Look we at generated. The, that direct traffic number is our email ad, is our email list. And so, it, from December 11th to January 11th, we generated something like 10,000 emails. Correct. Um, because of because of just being Out, outreach to Facebook and, and post posts. Being uh, we generous. Did, yes. So giving them, say, telling them we're going to give them uh, exclusive content information about the tour. You know, uh, you know, be the first. I mean, people signed up in droves, and we were just really kind of blown away by it. But you know, I never in a million years would have thought that you know email is so important today. Right. Um, so the first time we had a conversation with Pledge about this, you know. I, you know, I had said to Robert, you know, emails are going to be everything, so let's talk to them about how yeah, many emails did. we have. Yeah. And we were talking about having like 70,000 email addresses. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At the time, we didn't know that we really had zero. Um, the thing is about Facebook is that people aren't there to buy. They're there to, to be social. And so, you know, right. getting that conversion. The next one, you know, down is, is Facebook, you know, yeah. it's 6,000. You know, I mean, if you add up all of the Facebook channels, it's about 10. But, you know, um, it, it does go to show you that, you know, people are there not to really buy. you really got to do a soft sell, right. you know, with these people. So, so. we're looking to raise $97,000 for, um, f to finish, you know, to basically to, to do post-production on the film. R really, it's to defray expenses. Because it's not going to pay enough. It's not going to be enough to pay for it unless it goes way, way over the ninety-seven thousand dollar mark. But, but a lot of the point of the of the Kickstarter campaign is to create engagement and to be able to tell our story and to be able to demonstrate what the film is and to see to market and to and to create a, a as I said to create a product line. And 
right before we, we, we got here, we, 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 we looked and, and we were in yeah, like we're the end of day seven, now. so it's like yeah. $51,000 in, in six days, which is pretty, pretty great, especially considering we had no email addresses in, 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 on December 1st. And, and, and we, built our, we built our Facebook page, you know, in nine months' time. So, you know, I mean, I, I think that it's just a testament to say that, you know, like curation of content, really keep, you know, I, I've tracked other bands that, you know, are reuniting and stuff, and, you know, and, and really that's just the key. They're just not getting any traction because they're yeah. just not, they're, they're doing a snapshot, you know, once a week. So, yeah, know, I don't, I don't love week. when people come to forum and they, like, break their arms patting themselves on the back. So that is not what I'm doing here. What I'm trying to tell you is that this, reinforces the same crap I talk to you guys about all the time, which is the importance of ownership, the importance of email, the importance in telling your, of telling your story, the importance of generosity. Yeah. All I'm trying to tell you is that in very real terms, in very current terms, this is being proven out yeah. like in front of you. So if you guys care yeah. to follow that Kickstarter yeah. campaign, I'm not saying you've got to back it. <laughs> fine if you do. But, um, no, I'm not saying you got to back it, but if you guys want to follow it, it's absolutely fascinating. Or, or follow the activity on the Facebook yeah. page. It's absolutely fascinating to see what happens when you do things the way we try to teach you to do them in this program. Values, alignment. Uh, you know, I say it all the time, but it's what, it's what got us together. It's what, it's, what, it's what makes us relate to our audience. It's what allows us to know what's going to delight an audience member. It's what allows us to be sure that our email isn't going to right. alienate somebody and make them say, what a jerk. Right. It's what makes us sure that when we launch a Kickstarter campaign, we're not going to alienate our punk rock fans from the 90s who think it's a ghost, what? who think the door just flew open. Well, also it, it also, it is a testament to the, to like, again, going back to the experience, right? It's not about like why Bush needs money to make a record. <laughs> So many, the door was just closed. So. <laughs> Jay Crudy, everybody, thank you. Why, uh, why Bush needs you know money or Gwen Stefani or whatever needs money to huh? make a record or you know why does L seven need money to make a you know to, to, to finish the documentary you know whatever it's about the it's about the experience you know these people want to like you know be a part of the experience right. you know right. which is more than just you know a monetary you know exchange you know. So I yeah. hope this has been of value to you. I know it's getting late. I know we're out of time. But if you want to speak to Robert, please come on up. I have to go off to teach. But please, thank you. Join me.